good day, traders. This is Richard. So say hi to Mr. Richard. Hi, Mr. Richard. Good morning, Russell. Good morning, too. All right. We, uh, we covered some overview yesterday and kind of introduced the environment. Today, we're going to look at the environment in a little more detail from the standpoint of, of, of what we watch and how we watch it. And then how we select uh, trades from what we see. And we, uh, we trade what we see, not what we think. Uh, too many traders uh, lose too much money by overthinking what they think they should do with their money because maybe somebody else does it. They had a successful trade 10 years ago or 10 weeks ago or 10 days ago or 20 minutes ago, and they mention it. And so you get the idea, well, that's a good thing to trade. Let's go trade that because that guy made some money on it. And that's um, what we want to avoid. We must trade what we see. So let's, look at what we're seeing here. There's a, there's a tremendous amount of information presented before your eyes, way more than you can get your arms around. And when I use that term, I imagine yourself going out to the, going, going out in possibly your own yard and hugging the biggest tree in the yard. Can you touch your fingers around when you hug a tree? If you cannot, that tree is too big for you to handle. In other words, that trade might be too big for you to handle. So let's look at things in a piecemeal basis and figure out, well, maybe I could get my arm around one of those limbs, and uh, but it's so high up there, I need a ladder to do that. So let's try to find something we can get our arms around to manage and to manipulate and to control to our advantage. That's our mission. Now, there, everything revolves around uh, three things in our business. And, and this is a business. And it, if, if handled like a business, uh, you need to uh, get acquainted with your product that you want to uh, sell to people. Uh, you want to know your product really well. And the product that we're talking about is commodity futures. It has a very limited number of ingredients and there are approximately three dozen ingredients, three dozen instruments that we could trade and that's it. And if we wanna trade anything other than those three instruments, we have to leave this environment and go do something else, like go sell shoes. Maybe we wanna open a ladies, ladies shoe shop on the corner of Sixth and Figueroa in downtown Los Angeles. Well, there already happens to be some stores down there. So you gotta wait for one of them to come empty to get in there. You want a corner. You really want a corner and you want foot traffic so that, that you can show things off in the plate glass window. And when they're out walking around on their lunch hour and they see it, they'll come in on their break and buy some. So whatever it is you want to do, you got to become um, familiar with it to the point where you can operate to your advantage in the environment you choose. And so we have an environment that's brought to us by computer. And one advantage that you two gentlemen have is that you're both familiar with computers. I know your dad is, and I'm, I suspect that you are too, Russell. 
So you already know about the tool that you need to operate in this environment of, of, of trading because we do it on a computer. Now, there are lots of people who don't know computers. They just, they're just awkward to them and they don't even want to touch them. I mean, some people are still using flip phones because smartphones just bog them down in their mind. So they, they, don't want, they don't want to have a modern day Android or iPhone because it's just too complex for their mindset. Now that's not true of your generation, Russell, but your dad's generation and my generation, especially my generation, there's a lot of people that just don't want anything to do with that fancy stuff. They're still thinking that the, the phone in the hallway is what they, that's what they use to communicate. So here we are looking at these charts and, and there's hardly any indicators on these charts. All there, the only indicators on these charts are, well, let's open one of them up and see what the indicators are on here. We'll go into indicators. There's only two. There's a volume indicator and uh, a levels indicator we call pivots. So I'm gonna close that out. And now that we know what indicators are on this, these charts, I'm gonna blow one of them up. Now I've got, I've got 25 on here. You only see 14, you see seven across the top, I think one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. There's 14 on top, but there's some down here on the bottom. If I, if I click down here, I can change them. And we look at a different instrument across here. So there's seven different instruments across the bottom. So there's 25 total instruments available for our observation here. Let's start in the upper left-hand corner. That's where our eyes go first. And that's why I put crude oil up here. And crude oil is one of my favorite trading instruments. Crude oil is based on a rail car of oil. You've seen a train go by with lots of cars on it. They got box cars and flat cars and tanker cars. And that tanker car on that rail uh, road train it's in the middle of all those boxcars, holds 1,000 barrels of oil or 244,000 gallons of oil. Not gasoline, but unrefined oil. The black, ooky stuff that everybody hates because it's carcinic. It's, it has carcinogens in it and it uh, harms people and it has a bad reputation, but it's been around a long time and it's not leaving this decade, but it, it has to be protected. It has to be in, uh, environmentally controlled so it doesn't hurt anybody. And so it benefits society. Now I've blown up the chart so we can see the entire chart on the screen. And we have the volume down here on the bottom. I'm going to raise it up a little bit. And then notice over on the right hand side of the bottom portion here, we have the, the number of cars. That's, a, that's a, a term owned by floor traders of crude oil for years. Today, we, and there are also contracts. There is a futures contract for each car. I, I started talking to you a minute ago and mentioned a train because the trains have been around a lot longer than airplanes and even 18 wheelers. They've been around since 1840, 18, maybe even 18, 20. I don't know when they first came, but they were around in 1850 when the futures industry was embraced. And that was the main mode of transportation for heavy stuff is uh, the rails. So everything about the futures industry, except the financial instruments, 
is designed around how much of that commodity a rail car can hold. And a tanker car can hold 1,000 barrels or 244 gallons of oil. And another box car can hold 500 pounds of cotton. Um, it, um, that's not right. It's five, uh, 500 um, bunches or bales, bales of cotton. And it can hold 375,000 pounds of coffee. So we're talking about oil on this chart. And so there's a thousand barrels and there are 44 gallon barrels. So it's a thousand times 44, it's 144,000 gallons. Now, that's the mass that we're controlling with one single futures contract. And it's worth a hundred thousand dollars. Now that's not right. Um, the price varies, but it's based on the uh, the price of a barrel of a contract. you when we when we talk about the price. Let's say up here where the price is right now at fifty five oh six. It's right there at that R2. I'll, I'll explain the level in a minute, but you can see it's black and it's moving. It moved from 5504 to 5505, and now it's back to four, it's back to five. And that's how you know that's the current price right now. So if we were to go in with a trade right now, we would have to pay. 5504. If we want to sell it, we can do that. We can sell it before we buy it. That's okay in futures. In stocks, that whole business is wrapped around training people to buy the stock because the brokers make money when you buy. And you always buy before you sell. That's the mindset of the American public is to go buy some stock. But stock doesn't always go up. So you get you get damaged financially if you buy some stock at $55 and it goes down. You lose money. You didn't buy that stock for it to lose money. You bought that stock so you can make money because the broker said it's a hot item and it's gonna go up because of this, that, or the other thing. That's why you would buy it, is because you were sold on an idea that it would rise. All stocks are sold on the idea that they'll rise, but only about 20% do, the other 70%, 80% don't. Not, not right now, they might in five days or five weeks or five months or five years or five decades, but they maybe not now. You want your money this week. <laughs> you want to make some money today I want to make some money in the next 20 minutes when I get into a trade. I want instant gratification like so many of us do. That's what we want. We want to win. We want to throw on a basketball court. We want to be able to throw the ball, hit the basket without touching the rim and make it a score. That's what we want to do in trading. We don't want to miss that shot and let it get turned over to the other team and then have to run up and down the court and, and work hard to get the ball back? No, we want a shot, a successful trade, successful basket. We want success in whatever we do. So we have to learn how to do it. Like you've been on a basketball court. We all have. Some of us are good at it, and some of us are not good at it. Some of us are short, and some of us are tall. And if we happen to be tall and skilled in athletics and other athletics, we might become stars in basketball, but only about 3%. The other 97% are just not good enough to get on that court and play on that team, especially 
if it's a NBA, you got to be super good to get on the team. And you got to be super good to stay on the team. And if you do, you get really, 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 really rich. If you don't, why don't you stop trying to play the game? So in any event, to even try, you have to learn a lot. You have to learn to dribble. You have to learn to shoot. You have to learn to do all kinds of um, machinations of your skill set. You got to test everything about your body, everything about your mind. And the same thing goes uh, for, um, for futures trading or any other trading. Remember what a future is. A future is a contract between a buyer and a seller. And it is also, let's use a commodity. For example, a futures contract in oil is about the acquisition of, a, of, a, of an entity, a financial entity to hold for a period of time, no less than a minute, and no less than the contract period. And in crude oil, these contracts last for one month. And they roll over uh, around the middle of the month. So if you're in, right now we're trading uh, March oil. You see, it says up here to the upper left-hand corner, it says CL crude oil. 321. So it's a March 21 contract. And this is a 15 minute chart. You see the 15 up there right under my hand. Now, this contract is going to deliver around the 19th, no earlier than the 19th, no, no later than the 21st of this month. And the reason there's a spread in between the 19th and 21st is because of weekends and they, they, they're scattered all over the month. You never know exactly where they're going to fall. So there, there's a three or four day difference in when they might deliver. And so the delivery day is one day. The last trading day is another, might be a different day. And uh, the uh, futures deliver. They do not expire like stock options do, or futures options for that matter. There's options on futures too. We're not going to talk about that, but but there are. So those kind of things like options deliver, but futures uh, 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 expire. They expire. Uh, futures contracts do not expire. They deliver, meaning they transfer hands from one holder to another holder. And, and who would the hand transfer to in crude oil? Well, um, you're, you got a rail car full of oil, became a futures contract, and uh, where did the oil come from? Well, it came, out of, it came out of the ground into some farmer's property, and he had, he had the oil companies convinced him uh, 50 years ago to let him drill there, and the oil guy said, listen, we'll pay you for the oil we take off your land, you still can farm it and make grow corn or wheat or, or, or raise cattle, whatever you want on this land, but let us have this little space here uh, that we'll fence in to keep your cows from getting hurt and we'll take our oil out and it'll be ours, but we'll pay you for it. And then we'll take it out of the ground and keep it in a tank that we put inside our little fence area it's never even an acre of land. It's probably about the size of a, a large mansion. So that's all of the space they take up on a, on a farmer's property. And then they pump oil out and put it in a holding tank. And when that holding tank gets full, they either pipeline it somewhere or they 
park a truck truck there and fill up the tank, put it into the truck, and then the truck goes to the rail yard and, and dumps its load into a tanker car and a train. And when that tanker car gets full, then there's enough to make a futures contract. And that's where it it travels from that farmer's well, nearest rail um, point to the point where it delivers. And all oil delivers in Cushing, Oklahoma. Believe it or not, the oil capital of the world in 1907. Cushing has been the point where all oil is delivered ever since 2000, uh, since 1997. I mean, 1907, a long time ago, 100 years ago. And it's still, that's where, and I, I happened to be raised right down the street there in Tulsa. My dad was in oil business, so that's one of the reasons I kind of like oil. Because I, I have a history. But it's also one of the most fun things to trade because it moves and you can make good money trading it. So now you kind of know, imagine this chart being like a basketball court. And these candlesticks are the people that watch the game, the people who play the game, and people who manage the game, and people who control the game. And then the volume down here, uh, you can attach to another characteristic, maybe the size of the people, maybe their height. We got six foot people, five foot people, four, four and a half foot younger people, and six foot five basketball players, seven foot basketball players. Like this guy's a, a really tall basketball player, right? Well, that was, a, that was a huge amount of contracts went through right there. 16,000 contracts went through in a 15 minute period. You see my pointer over there on the right, 16,000. Over here, that one too. Both of them are 16,000. So if I click, push my, my center wheel down on my mouse, I will see it says 16,109. And it was up volume, in other words, buyer's volume. This one here was a uh, next door was selling volume. See, down volume was 14,998. So we 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 watch volume. We also analyze volume, and that's really important. The indicator to analyze volume is not here yet. I'm going to show it to you later, but I want to teach you the components of this chart as simple as I can make it. And what we have is across the, the bottom axis is um, the horizontal axis is time. And we're starting out over here at, um, at 1500 hours. Right here is uh, um, uh, three o'clock in the afternoon. It's fifteen hundred hours. Uh, this is in military time. So, if you don't yet know military time, uh, it's something that you probably need to learn because a lot of uh, time is shown in military time, and uh, we open at three o'clock in the afternoon and we closed at two o'clock in the afternoon. See this candle right here closed at 1400, which is two o'clock in the afternoon. And there was an hour that the market was closed. And then we opened over here at three o'clock, 1500. And this candle lived for 15 minutes. You see, it says right there, time 1515, that's when it closed. And it also showed you, it also shows you something else that's really important, and that is its character. 
Now you, as a person, you have a character. There's some characteristics about you that, that uh, people can identify you by. And the way we identify a candle, candle is by looking at four uh, uh, basic characteristics. That's the open of the candle, the close of the candle, and the high and the low, but we say it in a certain way. We say it O-H-L-C. Now jot that down. Open, high, low, close is the most basic uh, characteristic of a candle stick. Now these are, these are there's three or four different ways to mark up a chart to show the movement of price on a chart. And that's what the candles do. They show the movement of price. There's a line chart that was around in the 1920s and the 1950s uh, and the 1960s. And then somewhere in the late 60s or 70s, we, we started using these bar charts that had just a, they're just a stick with a little notch on the top where the open was if it went down and a notch on near the two thirds down or somewhere of where the close was. So the open was up on the top and the close was on the bottom for a bearish candle for a cell candle. And it was hard to tell whether it was a buy candle or a sell candle, because you had to look around for those little notches. It was hard to see. They were, there, they were there, and that's what they used, and they could see them, the people in the business, but it was harder to visualize the open and close. Not, you could see the open and close. No, you could see the high and the low. Here's the high right here, and there's the low. And here's... The black candle opens up here at this level. That's its open. And it closed right there. But while it was alive, it lived to trade down here at, to that very low. And it also, while it was alive, it raised its head up and traded the, up here to that high. So that's the high. This is the low. This is the open, and that's the close on a cell candle, a bearish candle. And now we're going to look at a white candle, which is a buy candle, a bullish candle. And we're going to look at this one that is mostly white with just a tiny little wick. You can just barely see the wick up there. You just barely see the wick down there. So this candle opened at the opposite end from a black candle, a sell candle. This is a buy candle. So it opens at the bottom and goes up. So write down about four things. Write down OHLC and label it open, high, low, close. And then write down that a black candle or a sell candle opens at the top of the body and closes at the bottom of the body. And then somewhere else on your page, write down a bullish candle, a buy candle opens at the bottom and closes at the top and it's white. Now to confuse things, I'm gonna comment on a side issue. Some charts have red and green in place of black and white. And that's prettier on a black background or a white background. It looks like Christmas, kind of like these uh, volume bars down here. So there's, there's multiple variations of, of display and I'm just mentioning it. Okay, now, we're going to um, look at a few indicators and we're going to, uh, I'm going to ask you to think for the first time. 
You've been taking in a lot of information and I haven't told you the answer to this question yet, but I'm gonna ask you to think about the answer before I tell you the answer. What direction do you believe price has been moving since we started over here at three o'clock yesterday and, and we ended right here at three o'clock well, this is actually the day before yesterday and here's the, the close for yesterday here's the open for yesterday here's the close for yesterday what direction was price moving yesterday in general uh up correct and today what's happened today this is today up more up okay so it moved up both days so two days in a row crude oil has moved up so that we, they uh, bear bullish. So that's bullish. Crude oil is recognized as bullish over the last couple of days. Now, I want you to look at the clusters of candles where change tried to occur, but it still continued in an upward fashion. And I see about four of them, four major ones and 15 or 20 minor ones. So help me find the four major ones. I'll show you. I'm gonna turn my drawing tool on and find a box. So I'm gonna draw a box around that. And then I'm gonna draw a box around this. Now I'll draw a box around that. Now there's a there's a, a little a little one here that didn't make a very big impact, but it happens to transverse the open and the close and the open because that's what this horse uh, vertical line here is the open and close. Now, it's important to know, I'm going to spread it out a little bit so you can see more detail. So I have to move it back and forth. I try not to move it too fast. So you can see that we were up here an hour before the close. And as we went into the close, we got a couple of cell signals. We got a cell signal here and then we got cell action here. I wonder why that happened. And then after the open, this is the last um, candle of yesterday. This is the first candle of today. So why do you think that after all this buying that they were selling right here at the end of the day? Okay. To answer that, a lot of these traders are short-term traders. They have a name for them. They're called day traders. They don't hold overnight. They enter trades and end trades within the same trading day. And they're called day traders for that reason. And all these traders were pushing this thing up. And there's five or six di different kinds of traders. There might be 150 different kinds of traders, but there's five or six I'm going to mention. These, these traders were bulls. They were pushing price up all all through here and and actually they did it all day long uh, they pushed price up all day but there were a few hiccups when they uh when the sellers tried to take charge and like a basketball game they passed the ball back and forth team to team there's two teams here there's the buying team and the selling team the buyers controlled the ball most of the last two days, but the sellers had the ball a few times. 
They couldn't do anything with the ball. They couldn't win the game. But they controlled the game for short, short periods. So the day trick, the reason these two black candles exist here is because this is uh, the last, this is the third last 15 minute, the second last 15 minute, and the last 15 minute. So these people actually uh, got off their trades, closed their trades. They're, they were long, they were buyers. When you're long, when you you hear the term long, that means you, you're in a buy position instead of a sell position. When you're short, you're in a sell position. You're holding short. You you want, you expect the price to go down, and you got short. Now these guys just got out, and they caused the shorts to to occur. And so a lot of a lot of uh, speculators. And that's what people are that trade this. They're, they're referred to as speculator. You might write that down. It's very hard to spell. I named a company. I named a company Cosmic Speculators back about 10 years ago. And every time I told people the name of my company, I had to spell out the word speculator. Cosmic they could get, but they thought it had to do with astrology or astronomy. Not, not trading, but anyway, it, it connotated trading. I'll, I'll explain it in a minute. Bottom line is the word speculator is very important. It's what we do. I mean, if you, if you shoot baskets on a court, you're called a basketball player. You're called a player. Well, we, we call these candles and there's only two kinds. There's sell candles and buy candles. And a sell candle is black and a buy candle is white. Now I'm, I'm going, I'm spending a little bit more time on this than you might think is necessary, but it's important that you, you grip this, the essence of these uh, basics so that when I use the terms in future discussion, that you'll know the meaning of the terms. The most difficult thing in learning anything new is to learn the jargon of the discipline that you're learning, whether it's biology or Spanish or English, you got to learn all that stuff that goes around so that you can absorb information and stack it on top of it, the previous information you got and, and use it to do whatever you want with it to prosper. So these two black candles resulted because all of these buyers decided to take their trades off in these last 30 minutes of trading before the last minute. And then a few people said, oh, well, now it's closing in 15 minutes. I'm gonna, I'm, I've been, I've been short waiting for this thing to sell off. Well, so, so I'm going to buy, I'm going to buy during this last, I've got to, in order to exit my trade, I have to buy to get out because I've been short and I, I haven't been winning today, but I have been short. And uh, I don't know if you follow Tesla automobile, but it has become the world's most interesting stock of the last, in the last two, three years. And, and uh, there were so many sellers in that stock all along. They just thought that thing was going to crash and burn. And, and they didn't like it. They hated it. They hated the car. They hated Elon Musk. They hated everything. They hated the idea because he wouldn't play in their game. He wouldn't set up a dealership and let them sell his cars. He sold them himself. And that was outside the norm of their philosophy. Other automobile companies, in other words, they hated him. They still do. He's changing the world of automobiles. I think he's a genius. He is a genius. There's no question about it. He's the Thomas Edison of the 21st century. He's the Stephen Jobs of the 21st century. He's head and heels above Jeff Bezos or Bill Gates or even Warren Buffett. Those are 
names that you need to know in our business. Those are the giants of the investing trading business. Now that's another thing I want to say. We are not investors. We are traders. There's a huge difference in a trader and an investor. Warren Buffett is an investor. And Bill Gates, he's a businessman, but he was a thinker. That's why I mentioned him. And thinkers stand above everybody else. Elon Musk is the best thinker that I can name. He's into solar, automobiles, and batteries, and space. Come on. How can you be in all three, three or four of those? I don't even know whether it's three or four. My point is he's into everything, and he he's succeeding at all three. And they just can't believe it. And they hate him for it. They're just a bunch of jealous people. All right. So my, my opinions, set those aside. Now, quick, go look at your paper. Tell me what OHLC is. I didn't hear anything. Unmute yourself. Uh, I, I'm not sure. Okay. Open, high, low, close. So let's go over it and again. On a white candle, this white candle right here, the open is here, the high is up here at the top of the wick, and the close of the candle is right here at the top of the body. That's what we call the white part or the black part is the body. I didn't mention that a while ago. I should have. So this is the body. And the body envelops the open and close. And the wicks, the black sticks, the bottom and top, indicate how far it sold off down to there or bought up up to there but couldn't sustain it up there. So sellers came in and pushed it back down and that's where it closed. So it opened here, sellers took control of it and pushed it down to there, buyers took, regained control pushed it back up to here, then pushed it back up through the body and closed it here. And they tried to push it all the way up there, but sellers came in and pushed it back down to there. And it closed. So open, high, low, close. Now I suggest that you draw a black candle and a white candle with a wick to so draw one black and then color it in and leave the white one hollow and put sticks on the top and stick on the bottom and then label one a buy and label one a sell. So label the, the hollow one or the white one a buy and label the black one a sell. And then also Call it a bull, call it a bear. The black one is a bear and the white one's a bull. Now, why is that? Why did those names get taken? Why, why is there a big brass bull on the street right there at Wall Street in New York City, right out in the main uh, thoroughfare, uh, divided highway? The bull is right there and it's, it's four or five times the size of a real bull. It's huge. It's a big thing. Lots of brass. Nobody's going to steal it. They, they, they'd have to get a crane out there, two cranes probably, to put it on a flatbed truck, and it would probably crush the, the flatbed. It's so heavy. Nobody's going to steal that ball. It's solid as a rock, like a cornerstone. I'm going to talk about cornerstones another time. Okay, so we've talked about what a futures contract is. Now, I've got a, I, I have a, I have a book, a PDF kind of a book where you, you can read it online. Uh, and it, it's called uh, the Trader's Handbook, I think. It was written by some 
some traders at the Chicago Board of Trade back about 20 years ago, and it, it describes what a future is. And it's not important that you read that book uh, this week or next month, but it is uh, a reference tool that you might want to pick up a, a month or two from now and read a couple of paragraphs, maybe even a couple of chapters. But it's not important that you read the whole thing at this juncture, but it is a book that tells the story of a lot more depth than I'm telling you now. Because if I try to tell you all there is in that book, it, you, your eyes would glaze over. I just want to give you enough information to operate in our world, to operate in the environment that you've chosen to learn about. And I know what you want to do. You want to trade. And uh, it's, it's kind of like a video game. Uh, this, this to me is the best video game in the world because you can make money doing it and also lose money. Now, I've been looking at this cluster of candles ever since we started talking. We've been talking for 45 minutes, uh, nearly an hour, 55 minutes. Um, I've been seeing this as a potential uh, sell signal right here. And there was a little bit gain, but now it's kind of going against that trade. We got down to here, we had to get out right here to make any money because this, this candle took away our, most of our profit, at least half of it, if we, if we executed our sell right here. And now most of our sell is, is, most of our sell gain is gone. It was present down here, but they've taken it away from us. And so I want to explain a little bit more why we trade at this maybe ungodly hour. I know your dad hates to think about getting up at 4.45 in the morning or 4.15 in the morning. You probably don't like it either because you're used to going to bed at 10 or 11 o'clock, maybe midnight, and you need to get six or eight hours of sleep. We all do. I'm, I've learned that the sweet spot in trading is between five and seven, and that's why I manage my life around it. And why is that true? Because crude oil right here, you can see, it's starting to lose its, its uh, momentum. The momentum was pretty good right in here. It's beautiful. The momentum was terrific here, and then we consolidated over here, and we had a little momentum here, and then a little bit of uh, sell-off here, and more momentum here, and then we got into another channel, and then we had a little momentum, but it's late in the day for crude oil. I mentioned earlier in the discussion that crude oil, crude oil sweet spot is really from three o'clock in the morning until seven. And now it's eight. And so it's losing its luster. And what you, what, what you would trade nowadays, I mean, this time of day are the index futures. They, the stock market opens at 6.30 in the morning in California. It's really 9.30 in New York City where the stock market is, but it's really not in New York City anymore. It's on everybody's computer. And I don't care whether you're in Hong Kong, in Frankfurt, or in uh, Sydney, Australia. You've got the stock market. You've got the futures market at your fingertips on your keyboard, on your computer, screen it's right there and your money's right there with it you do not have to be in new york city anymore but 30 years ago you did you wanted to trade you had to be in chicago or new york city that's the only places you could trade and actually there were a few other places but those were the main places now we've got it all at our fingertips on our computers. Lots of movie stars trade. I've heard that uh, two singers in particular, senior people like myself, uh, uh, share, I think she trades. And so does the other one uh, that uh, did burlesque. What was the name? What was her name? My wife loves her. They're day, tra they're day traders. 
and they got enough money to do it. <laughs> but you don't need to be a, a star to day trade. You just need to have some savvy and learn how to do it before you risk your money. And it's so important that you learn how to do it before you risk your money because your money will just seep out the seams and be gone before you know it if you don't, if you don't learn uh, how these candles interact with each other. Just like if you want to operate in society, you kind of have to learn the personalities of the people you associate with. And you already know that there's good people in the world and not so good people in the world. And you want to associate with the ones that are good people and uh, good influences on you. And uh, you want to be a good person so you have good influences on them. And these candles, once you get acquainted with them, are just as important to learn the personalities of as it is your friends. And you kind of know your friends you know what makes them angry. You know what makes them happy. You know what makes them sad. And you know kind of what they think about and some of their interests. And if you want to do something to make them happy, you kind of offer them something that you know they're interested in and you make them happy. And if you are pissed at them and don't want them to be so happy, I guess there's something you could do to make them unhappy, but that's not positive, that's negative. You want to stay away from negative and be positive. And in uh, this work we do, you want to be able to know when you would buy and when you would sell. And I'm, I'm commenting now that I would I would sell here. However, it's too late in the day for crude oil to take to initiate a new trade either direction because it just lollygags. Do and that's that's a that's an Oklahoma term. I don't. That's where I was raised, and it just means do nothing. It'll just do this for the rest of the day until two o'clock when the market closes. And then after the market opens, it'll do that. It, it won't Asia. When the market opens, when the market, market closes at two o'clock in the afternoon, California time, that happens to be eight o'clock in the morning in Hong Kong, where the market opens in an hour at three o'clock Pacific. But it's nine o'clock or eight o'clock in the morning in Hong Kong. I don't know which, but that's when their trading day starts. And that's when the, the world market opens. 20 years ago, the bell to bell in New York City was the market. 9.30 to 3.30, or 9.30 to 4. In New York City, that was 5, uh, it was, uh, uh, let's see, 6.30 in the morning here. And we closed at 1. That's all there was. It wasn't a an international operation. It was a Wall Street thing. The stock market opened and closed, and that was the world. 9.30 to 4, New York City. 6.30 to 1, Los Angeles. Now it is a 23-hour market. And the meat of trading is from this period. I'll get another box here. I want three o'clock in the morning. It's the best trading time right here. Now, if you, if you draw a vertical line down. I drew two lines side by side. I want three o'clock. This is when gold and oil and the euro start trading. And this is where 
they wind down seven. I think that might be 645. So this is our sweet spot. Now you can see Europe opened over here at midnight or 11 o'clock, depending on daylight savings time. And when I say Europe, there's two different time zones in Europe, Europe like there is here. There's four time frames in America. We've got Pacific, Mountain, Central, and Eastern. And then Maine, they've got some Atlantic, but it doesn't count. So in Europe, they have two time zones, London time and Frankfurt time. Frankfurt is in Eastern Germany. Berlin is in West, I'm sorry. Berlin is in Eastern Germany. I get backwards when you get to Europe. Berlin is in, in Eastern Germany, close to this, you know, the uh, Russia. And then Frankfurt is in west of Berlin, quite a ways. Like New York would be east, and Los Angeles is west. So there's two time zones in Europe. France is in the uh, uh, some of it is in the east, the eastern part of Europe, the London time, and then the rest of the continents in in the, the next hour they're at is two hours. So London opens before Frankfurt, and Zurich in Switzerland is another financial world of center, and it opens the same time Frankfurt does. So now I'm giving you a little more perspective. The, I'm giving you some big picture, and I've, I've brought you down to some small picture. The candlesticks are the small picture, and the environment they operate in is in the big picture. And they operate all over the world, and you have to become familiar with the whole world. Okay, it's 7 o'clock, 8 o'clock, I mean. And... Uh, I'd like to offer you an opportunity to ask a few questions if you'd like to. Thanks, Richard. <clears throat> uh, my question is um, on the three o'clock one, if you bought like around one o'clock, let's say you bought at one o'clock, when would you sell to make profit? Okay, uh, one o'clock is right at the edge here of the box. This is one. And that's when uh, Europe opened. They open actually, I think they open at 11 o'clock, but they too, there's not much action for the first hour. Like when we open at two in the evening uh, or to three in the evening afternoon, there's not much action until seven o'clock at night. I can trade oil or Euro or gold between seven and nine at night. You get in and out and make three or four hundred dollars. Uh, so that that's the sweet spot spot to trade in the evenings, seven to nine. So when you get your software, and uh, that's the next thing I want to talk about, but we've run out of time today. Uh, um, but tomorrow we'll mention software, and on Thursday. We'll, we'll install software. The software that I'm using to display this chart is something you will download uh, from the internet onto your desktops and each one of you will put it on your respective desktop. Now it doesn't work on a, it works on PC. This software does not work on, um, I noticed you're using a, a Mac, you're using an iPod, iPod, iPad. And this software doesn't work on the Mac environment that works on PCs. You have a PC in your house? Yeah, Russell has a PC. Actually, the Mac can have a Windows also on the Mac. You got Windows on your Mac? Good. You're 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 in the right neighborhood. I, I've got a Mac that's 2012 model, but it still works perfect. And I've got Bootcamp on it with uh with all this software. Here's the software we're going to download. Is called. Uh, um, Ninja and I will show it to you, but I, uh, it, I will, I want to lead you through downloading it. It's just easier than trying to, uh, figure it out for yourself. Uh, it's, uh, let me type it in here. 
Russ, do you have any questions? Nope. Notice how I type Ninja Trader in, but Interactive Brokers comes in before me. It how does it do that? How does it? How much money does it have to spend to completely knock out Ninja Trader, and you got to go all the way down here to get to it? Uh, they probably spend like, and it depends, five hundred to a thousand dollars a month at least. Okay, well now this is really interesting. They have they're letting. Their, their, their new customers trade micro without any broker commissions right now. That's good because that's what we're going to be doing is trading these micros uh, when we start trading, but it's going to be a, a while before we do it, but we do need to look at the charts. So this is the link that I'm going to drop into your Skype, Ryan. Russell, do you have a Skype? Uh, no, I don't have a Skype, but uh, I could just get it from my dad. So. Okay. Well, I guess I didn't copy it. I thought I did. Okay. Well, we covered some more stuff. Tomorrow we'll cover some more and we'll uh, get your software installed so you'll have it for this weekend if you want to play with it. Because we're going to give you a tool that will enable you, able you to trade uh, even without internet. Yeah, just in case the internet goes down, you got something to play with. And uh, so we'll accomplish all that over the next two or three days. I'll see you in the morning at seven o'clock. Th thanks, Richard. You're welcome. Thank you for your attention. Uh, Russell, what do you say to Mr. Rich Mr. Mr. Richard? Thank you, Mr. Richard. Well, you're welcome, Russell. Okay, we're gonna get some breakfast and get ready for a regular class. All right. Uh, I think Jacob's here too. Oh, Jacob here? Hello, Jacob. Yeah. He's on the phone. Yeah. Um, I guess we can talk about what we're going to do. Hold on. We're going to get together at 9 o'clock? Yeah. You want to you take a break? Get to get together at 9? Yeah. Yeah. I, I need to um, do something for my wife, and then I'll be, be available at 9. Okay. It'll be a quick one. All right. Okay. Talk to you at 9, 9 o'clock. Bye-bye. Thanks. 8280, blind, crippled, or crazy. I will teach you how to use my right hand trade to take 500 a day to keep the job away in just one hour a day while you watch us trade live right before your eyes.